Hello and welcome everybody. Uh, whether you're watching live or whether you're watching the replay, if you've read the book, if you're planning to read the book, if you have no intention of reading the book, whatever your story, you are welcome. I'm so glad that you're here for book club. And so just a little bit about book club. So my name is Julie Faye Fan Balzer and I love art books and I totally keep buying, borrowing, uh, finding, you know, way too many of them. And what I found is I would sort of flip through them or like be glad that I had them and then they would sit on the shelf and I wouldn't do anything with them. So I really started book club as a way for, uh, well, to force myself to actually dive in, do the exercises, read the text, do the book as opposed to just sort of owning art books. And also as a way of connecting, of course, with people like you, people who love art books. So today we're going to be discussing Mark Harold's workbook. And I think I stumbled across this book for the first time in a gift shop when I was on a visit to London. And, uh, it just blew me away. Everything about it just absolutely blew me away. I love his style. I love his work. I think he's absolutely fantastic and um, too heavy to take on the plane. So I ended up buying it when I got home and it is a visual treat. So I've had this book for a couple of years and I have to be completely frank and say, I flipped through it many times. I've looked at the pictures many times. I've never read the text until now, right? Until I had to prepare for book club. I had absolutely never, ever read the text, not even once, not even the intro, not even really the captions. And I'm probably not alone, you know, kind of raise your hand if you're one of those people who also maybe looks through the book, but doesn't necessarily read all the text. So I'm glad I did. I pulled a bunch of stuff out of it. So this pod, this podcast kind of a podcast, I guess, except you can see me. This video is kind of divided into two parts. In the first part, I'm going to sort of take you through the book, show you a little bit about it, show you some pictures, um, chat with you, you know, uh, as you leave comments in the comment section. And then in the second half, I'm going to teach you some strategies that you can use because this isn't a um, teaching book. Like there aren't instructions, there aren't exercises. So how do you learn from this? Like what are some concrete things you can do for yourself to learn from books like this? Because there are lots of them out there and certainly from dead artists. Like how do you learn from Monet and Matisse and Van Gogh or artists that you'll, or, who are contemporary artists you'll never get to take a class with, right? How do you do that? And so these strategies should help you. So first, let's go ahead and dive in to the book. And if you're here and you want to jump into the chat and say hello, like Laura and Teresa and Marilyn and Anastasia and Lee, who've all jumped in, I would love to hear from you. Know if you've read the book, if you haven't, your feelings on all of it, but let's go. So here is my overhead camera and let's get this guy big, right? Just like this, maybe just like that. There you go. Uh, yeah. And Kat says, yay to strategies, strategies for learning on your own. That's 100% the way that I think about it all the time, because I really think that, um, I'm, I'm a big fan of like teach a man to fish, uh, that old saying, and he eats for one day or sorry, give a man a fish. He eats for one day, teach a man to fish and he eats his whole life. Sorry, baby up at five 30. My brain isn't totally there. So welcome everybody. Uh, welcome Susan and Lizzie and Jen. So, okay, so here we go. Mark Harrell's workbook, and I'm going to give you the first tip. Not only is this a beautiful book, but you guys take off the dust cover, the book jacket. Have you done that? Because bam, look at that. And it is embossed and it's hard to show texture, but it is embossed on there. So you get like a bonus beautiful image to think about. He's such a master with the way that he knows what should be dark and what should be light. If you're interested at all in any printmaking, I think Mark Harold is a great example. So you can see some beautiful printing he's done, really thoughtful layered printing of several different stamps or blocks or whatever you want to think about them there. And I love how he leaves, you know, uh, rubber behind. He's actually, it's probably lino. So lino behind as he's carving and stuff. So he is an artist who does a bunch of different things. And one of the things he does is a lot of collage. So there's tons of cut paper into this. And you know that that's totally my thing. So I'm 100% into it all the way. Um, these are cut paper, absolutely gorgeous. And to, just to think about it, like this, these aren't even really part of the book. 
This is just like the introduction to the book. Hey, take a little peek here. And you can see this is his beautiful writing, which he uses throughout the book as well. And he lives in creative chaos, which I'm all the way into. So this is him. This is Mark Harold. And he talks a lot about um, sort of, or the book introduction, which is written by someone else, talks a lot about him from sort of almost an academic art point of view, kind of some of his influences, which we'll talk about a little bit later, and sort of how he got to where he is now. There's some conversation around methods, though not a lot. They sort of mention things like, oh, he does a lot of lithographs, he draws, he does other things. One of the things I know is that he makes wallpaper. And I have a dream that one day I will have his wallpaper somewhere in my house. But one of the things I love is he, uh, this is uh, a little scene in his home, but he loves to collect things and he loves to put things together. And he says that that actually informs his art. And I think that when you look at some of his artwork, knowing now that one of the things he likes is synthesis, right? How to create sort of more or pull disparate items together that you wouldn't think go together. His artwork makes so much sense. So Ellen says that she loves the book. It's just beautiful. And that um, some of the images reminded her of a couple of works that she did in boot camp. That's design boot camp, one of my classes. And hers were just paint. This is inspiration. Take these chickens further and incorporate collage. Yeah, here's a lot of animals, Ellen, which totally reminds you, reminds me of your work. And Sherry says, yeah, visual chaos is just gorgeous. And there's so much to look at every nook and cranny. This is an idea that I think everybody should take away. So this, what this is, is this is a chart of inspirations, themes, and connections in Mark Harold's head. And so it's, it's like all the different things he's talking about, the things he likes, collage, illustration, folk art, William Morris, Picasso, you know, different artists that he likes, all sorts of like people who are influenced from, from literature, you know, uh, this says Black Eyes and Lemonade popular art exhibition. You know, I, I think this is a great idea to sort of map out where your inspiration comes from. It would really make you think a lot about what's going on. So I highlighted a little thing here I wanted to read to you. So here's what it says. It says, um, the act of cutting out abstract shapes that when brought together form a recognizable image of a landscape or an animal seemingly full of vitality requires a particularly graphic handling of color and form. Harold's approach to collage reflects his magpie eye. His collector's instinct for finding visually attractive materials and bringing them together. He particularly admires Victorian decoupage screens decorated with cutout vignettes. Quote, there's nothing I like better, he explains, than trying to find visual equivalents for things just lying around, like a piece of paper that has been used to wrap up some flowers, an old bit of newsprint, or Florentine paper pattern. I enjoy bringing these things together and making them work. I enjoy playing off the tensions of the different materials, end quote. And I wanted to read that because I think that the more that you know what you like, what you enjoy, people are so worried about style. I hear this all the time from, if I may, Soapbox for just one moment. So I talk to a lot of my coaching clients, uh, people in boot camp, like all sorts of students who have a real concern about their style and they feel like they need to commit to do, you know, maybe I should just do collage. Maybe I should just do painting. Maybe I should only do abstracts and I shouldn't do any realistic, whatever it is. And I'm going to tell you that that's format. That's not your style. Dial. Mark Harold is doing printmaking of all different kinds. He's doing painting. He's doing illustration. He's doing um, collage. He's doing all sorts of stuff. And he still has the same style. Your style is who you are. It's the things that interest you. It's the way that you bring colors and patterns and ideas and, and textures. And, you know, it's this, it's subject matter. It's, it's the you-ness of it. And so I think we put too much emphasis on when we say like what kind of art we make, I'm an abstract landscape painter. And that may be very easy for people to digest and understand. And that's great. I absolutely think that's fantastic. But I personally believe, and partially I think this is based on the fact that I'm a person who's interested in a lot of different disciplines. I think it's more important to get to the root of why you create. So whether I'm um, carving stamps or whether I'm collaging or whether I'm painting or whether I'm doing a craft project, you know, the thing that drives me, the thing that's always there with me is a, a, a very strong sense of like graphic design and putting things together that aren't supposed to go together, just jamming them together and making it work. That's what personally interests me across the board at all times. I think it's why I'm on a weaving quick kick right now, because I'm really interested in how things 
gets smashed together. So think about that for yourself. You know, what is it that you are absolutely interested in, not just format, but that really drives like the things that you do. I think that's a great tip. Okay. So, so many beautiful things. He talks about how travel, you know, influences his work. He talks, one of the things I love is his birds, by the way. These, oh, I'm too big. The book is too small. I love these birds that he creates. And I actually, um, this is maybe two or three years old. This is a block that I carved where I try to sort of get at what his birds are doing. And oh my God, these simple forms, which look so fantastic for him, just were a little more problematic for me to kind of figure out how they work. I was partially trying to sort of also make them my own and not just lift one of his. I sort of think I was halfway successful. But, you know, I think it's also interesting to understand scale. When you look at this, I think of it being maybe the size it is here in the book, which is pretty big. But oh my goodness. Look at the scale of it when you see it with him. It's ginormous. It's a poster, right? And so I think that scale makes a huge difference too, thinking about how much space he has to play with when he's creating so many of these little details and these little marks because they are very, 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 very detailed if you check out what's going on with these pigeons. Absolutely beautiful. Um. And uh, Pepper, thank you very much. She says that she really likes my style and a lot of things put together and making it work too, 100%. And Jan's talking about style uh, and saying that, yeah, you, you should call yourself an artist with confidence. And I'm glad that I could be helpful in that journey, Janet. I think that, you know, a lot of people say like, you know, how do you, how do you, are you willing to call yourself an artist? You know what? The day you create art, you're an artist. The day that you, you know, adopt a child or become a stepmother or give birth to a child or whatever, you're a mother or a father. And so I don't know why the day you make art, you're not an artist. Doesn't make any sense, right? The act of doing. Okay, so beautiful, beautiful, beautiful. I love his use of color. And one of the things I love about color is the way he uses overlapping color. So check it out. Can you see how this yellow over the blue creates a green? And I did try something similar, which I will show you in a bit less successfully. And again, you can see how the color over, oops, the color overlaps. So you can still see that building behind it. And it's kind of tells a story the way that the color overlaps. I just think it's really beautiful and really, really cool. Um, I could look through every single page of this book with you. These lino cuts in particular influenced me and inspired me. And I'll show you what I made sort of based on some of the ideas that I saw here. These are, he sends out Christmas cards. And don't you want to be on that Christmas card list? I do. Um, he does a ton also of lithographs which are beautiful. We're starting to get into sort of a collage phase here as well, but you can see he moves seamlessly from drawing into collage, into block printing, and it all goes together and his style holds true across everything. And one of the things that the book does that I like is that in the captions, he talks a little bit about, for instance, it says here, um, the simplicity of this collage, a benign looking duck in a formalized farmyard responds to the directness of folk art. I particularly enjoyed creating the surface of the rusty door that frames the space. You know, and I think it's like getting a little bit of the artist's perspective on what's happening, what's interesting to him about it, what he enjoyed about it. It does make you feel a little bit like you're, you know, sitting in his workroom, which I really appreciate too. So, so many beautiful pictures. And I know I want to look at every picture for a hundred years and you could study this. I really think you could study this book for a year to really learn from him and think about the way that he does things. But look at this, right? It's an owl here. And then you can see his owl cards that he made. This is a, set, a concertina card, which holds sort of accordion style. Can you see that sort of three panels of owl? So things keep informing each other and sort of rolling down the lane which I think is really, really cool. Because I think a lot of times we think we have to keep reinventing the wheel, but you don't. You need to keep playing with an idea until you're, you know, really, really, really done with it. Um, Kate says, I like when you show the same subject rendered in two different ways on page 48 through 49. Let's look at that then. Let's see. Here you go. Um, 
So the Orchard of Bridge Farm in Heslington is what this is. And you can see Red Admiral, butterflies feeding on rotting apples, the ordinariness of the orchard that is at the same time its special beauty, a green space with geese drinking from the galvanized zinc wash tubs framed by the arcing boughs of the apple tree. I made the collage orchard geese. Here you go. And more recently, the lithograph in response to a favorite location. So these are the two. This is the lithograph and this is the collage. And it's the same space but two different pieces so you can kind of keep being inspired right and then here's a photograph you can almost feel like this guy was taken sort of from there you know what i mean and then this is almost as if this guy is maybe that one or from memory it's kind of a really neat idea thanks kate for pointing that out um, so Ellen says that she was intrigued by lithograph and yeah, I don't think of lithograph as a really modern way of printing. And it turns out you can do lithography in your kitchen, uh, it involves tin foil and Coca-Cola and a bunch of other stuff, but it's interesting. You really, um, can do a lot of printmaking at home if you want to give it a try. Okay. So we continue through the book. It's full of some found papers, some painted papers, just, I mean, just absolutely beautiful he does so many interesting little paper cutting things. He sends a lot of mail. I think, you know, I don't know him at all, obviously, but I think he's a person who probably loves to make things with his hands. I mean, how cool would it be to get that as an envelope? Um, and lots of just beautiful, beautiful, beautiful things throughout. I love the moments best when you can see him in, in uh, relationship to his work and also, again, understand the scale of these pieces, which I think is hard to understand without a human being. Here you can see the effect of the spray paint in here, giving it a kind of dreamlike look. Really neat stuff. So birds and beasts are definitely uh, one of his favorite things to do. He tends to do sort of ordinary creatures. Um, and here you go, you can see here he's doing a couple of different exotic creatures. But one of the things I wanted to point out here before I forget is look, Look how these are not squared. Not really, right? This is a shadow. These pieces extend off. These pieces extend off. These pieces are like constructions that stand out. I want to do this. Look how cool that is. Why should your paper have to be square? Why, why, why? Look how these pieces just extend beyond the bottom in some places. And it just even more adds to the feeling, right, of this thing jumping out at you. One thing I was thinking a lot about as I was flipping through this book and reading about he did train as an artist and an illustrator is how important drawing is to block printing, how important drawing is even to collage. I know that there are people out there who say, I hate to draw. I can't draw. I don't want to draw. Um, I'm not good at it. And I'm going to tell you, I really think it is practice. I've spent most of my life believing that I was a person that couldn't draw and still I, until I realized that the reason I can read and write is because I went to school. And for, you know, at least 12 years, I read and wrote every single day. So now I can read and write. And if I had drawn every single day, guess what I'd be able to do is draw. So now I do try to draw as much as possible so that I can train myself. Um, this had a quote that I loved from Picasso. It's a sort of a, um, I'm not sure if it's a direct quote, but it says, Picasso said something like, all the art is on the floor. Um, and he is interpreting that as saying that the discarded remnants of one collage are the starting point for the next, because a lot of this collage came from things he had cut away for another collage. And so I think sometimes I'm taking the metaphor out even bigger to say, like, sometimes when you fail and there's a failure, that's actually going to be the key to your success. Sometimes when there's something that, you know, doesn't work out. That's actually the beginning of something new. Sometimes when you think you've hit that locked door, right, something new and exciting is about to begin. So just, I think that's a great way to think about it. We don't look down at the floor at the garbage. But maybe that is a good way or a good place to look at it. What is an old idea when you're stuck, you know, that could be a new idea? Um, I've been talking a lot this week in boot camp about um, value and stuff like that. And you can see in some of these black and white renderings what a master he is at just using black and white and really paying attention to all sorts of value. I love the way the birds stand out in this snowy landscape because he's done all of that in sort of black and white and blues. And then the birds just pop, you know, as almost like little uh, winter flowers. 
in the sky or something like that. Uh, and Kate says that uh, I know nature is his primary focus, but I kept going back to his Venice work. I love those pieces. Yes, great merging of nature with architecture. I agree, Kate. I also really like his seaside stuff, which surprised me because I'm not normally like a nautical person, but I really liked it. So he does a lot of design work, which I think some artists look down on sometimes or the art world does sometimes, but I think is exciting and fantastic. So like I mentioned, he has wallpaper. He does a ton of posters. Oh my gosh, look at this. I, I mean, it, I love this. I covet this. It's just absolutely stunning. Don't you want to have this be your wallpaper? I do. He makes fabric. Yum, yum, yum. I actually found this morning on uh, Mercari. Uh, a shirt that he had designed for something at the Tate. Uh, of course, it was a size small, so it's not going to be for me, uh, but a beautiful block printed pattern all over it. I love the way that he, um, this is words for a tote bag that he made for the Tate. Just really beautiful stuff. This is some um, stuff where he's color boarding and thinking about what he's going to do, you know, and how to put it together, how it should go together, sort of how these, this is the sketches for a repeat pattern that eventually became this repeat pattern which is really cool. Um, he has painted pottery. So one of the things I thought was really, really interesting. How many times have I said interesting? My mom's going to call me later today and say, stop using the word interesting. One of the things I found really surprising and compelling is how often he collaborates with other people. And so he doesn't make pottery, but he has uh, first went to like a paint your own pottery studio and just wanted to do the painting part. Then he has collaborated with a potter who makes the pots and does all the finish glazing and stuff. And he does the decorating. He has collaborated with woodworkers to do it. He often, um, there's a place that he prints at where what he does is he goes and like does the carving and sort of sets up the print and does the color proofing. And then someone actually else does the physical labor of making, right, the additions that need to get done. So, uh, so much of his work is handmade, but as I think for a lot of successful artists, he doesn't necessarily actually touch every single thing every single time um this was lovely this is um his birds being sold they're hanging wooden pigeons and you also can see some of his cups and stuff for sale here this these are some wood pieces that he's working through so again all over the place here he is collaborating with this carpenter to make sure that his bird sculpture is going to actually stand up an important Thing. I love these dioramas. Really beautiful. He's an illustrator and you'll see he has collaborated with his wife on this piece, for example. This is her lettering and then his work around it. But he does all kinds of posters and advertising. And I think the thing that's so interesting about that is when you're doing um, graphic design like that, and these are book covers and ideas for book covers, you really need to focus on readability and that graphic quality that we come back to one more time that he really has the ability to say this shape of paper cut out is going to look like a butterfly. This shape is going to, you know, represent it. Um, I tried to get this book for my son, but the, the price has been jumping like crazy. So I'm bargain hunting and hoping that it comes down. Um, but just so many beautiful ways of combining all different kinds of art. Look at these birds that he made, these paper birds hanging from this tree. And a lot of times, one of the things he does is think about how to mass produce things because he does get a lot of that kind of work. So how can you give that handmade feel, but on a mass produced item? Here he talks about different scrapbook material that he uses. Of course, mail is so much important for him. You know, anyway, I think I flipped through the entire book for you now. It's a beautiful, 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 beautiful book. And here is what I made inspired by the book. So I did some, I did, I did a bunch of different stuff, but I did a bunch of um, just sketching of some, you can see some of the birds trying out some different ideas for kind of designs. There was a lot of test printing of things that happened. I ended up carving three blocks that go together. So these are three by four inches. So there's three blocks that go together. And oh, oh, management of stuff. Oops, bang. So there you go. You can see my pile of rubber that came out of these three blocks. 
And I made these beautiful, or I think they're beautiful, multicolored prints inspired by him. And one of the things I liked so much, let's see how good my camera is. Can you see the little lines that are on top of the black here? One of the things that I took away from this book is that he prints the black first and then the other colors on top. So it means that in some of the solid black areas, you can actually see the pattern of what's printed on top of it. And I thought that was the coolest thing ever. So I played with that. And I played with a bunch of different color combinations. So you can see how different each of these unique prints looks depending on which colors you use. Kind of a fun trick. Um, and then some of them I was really careful with registration. Some of them I was a little less careful with registration to see how it worked out. Uh, but these are this is really interesting. So this very subtle green that's in here is the same as the very subtle green that's in here, except it looks so different when there's an actual green versus a blue, you know? And I, I just think like that, this is the same subtle green, but with a yellow. Colors are relative to each other in terms of how they appear. Uh, and by the way, if you want to grab one of these prints for yourself, they're in my shop. They're $25 each and I will, they're not signed yet, but I'm going to sign and date them and I will put them in the mail to you, free shipping in the U.S. if you're interested. Okay. So, uh, and the other thing is, let me just, since I have it here, let me print these birds just so you can see what they look like. And I'm just going to use an ink pad. You could of course use stamping ink if you wished, but why don't we just use an ink pad for now so you can just see what this ends up looking like. So I'm using right here Versamark or Versafine Claire. I use a wide variety of ink pads, but these ones are great if all you're doing is printing on paper. If I'm printing on top of paint, I don't like to use them because they're pigment ink and they don't really dry on top of paint. So that's when I bring out the archival ink. Block printing ink, if I'm printing on fabric, is a must. But here you go. So let's see. Don't have any registration. So let's aim for the middle. Aim for the middle. Give it a rub with my Baron. Oh, I got ink all over my fingers. Not great. Not great. I get ink on my fingers all the time. Okay. How did it turn out? Let me wipe my fingers off before I try to pick it up and see what we got. Okay. Ta-da! There you go. Pretty little print. I think I can see how much I've grown as an artist. If I look back, why did I put these so far away? Uh, if I look back, you know, this is sort of where I am right now as a printmaker. And this is where I was maybe two years ago. You know, I think you see a lot of growth from practice, which is important. Okay. So uh, before we keep going, uh, let me take a look in the comments and see what people have to say. Uh, yeah, I'm so glad that it's new to you, that he's new to you. He's a great, and he has an Instagram account, so take a look. Um, so I don't use ink pads for fabric. There are some, I think it's VersaFine, something or VersaClary that you can use, VersaMark, you can use for fabric. You have to use block printing ink for fabric. OK, um, I do. Uh, I have taught all sorts of classes about printing on fabric. So if that's a topic you're interested in, um, you can check out my print inktober class and it has all the information that you need about printing on fabric. If that's something that you're interested in and you can find all my classes, I guess, if I can find where I have that at uh, balderdesigns.com. So if you're interested in any kind of printmaking like that, take a peek, sign up for a class. It's lots of fun. And of course, if you don't want to miss out on anything that's happening, you can sign up for my weekly newsletter. And I put the URL right there, uh, bit.ly slash weekly balzer. 
Okay. Uh, okay. So let's go ahead and now talk about strategies. Let me move this out of the way before I stick my thumb in it or something else and the ink pads and everything else and keep everything nice and neat. There we go. Okay. So let's talk about strategy. Um, Let's see. Okay. So here are my slides. Tips for getting the most out of an art book that doesn't have any instructions. So here are instructions on how to get the most out of an art book without instructions. So you're going to make lists. This is it. This is the key moment. This is the thing that's important to you. There's, there's going to be four lists. One is things to look up. One is quotes. One is ideas to try. And one is observations and questions. And you can, of course, make up your own categories. But I think these really are the major categories that will help you actually get something to do, something practical and tangible out of a book that doesn't have instructions. So look for the sake of illustration, I have here a couple different things that I think you could look up from this book. So one thing, for example, is the word inscape. They talk at the beginning about how Mark Harold's work is influenced a lot by inscape. I had no idea what this word meant. And obviously, it's very important to him. So I had to look it up. So I won't make you read all this text, but I have the two sources there where I found this. But um, in essentially, uh, in essentially, essentially, Inscape is like the thing that makes things unique. So it could be like an an oak tree has a particular Inscape. A squirrel has a particular Inscape. So it's kind of about like uh, unique individuality of everything that's uh, that uh, is alive. And uh, the original. Um, person who came up with the term inscape is Gerald Manley Hopkins, who was a religious poet and see, so he sort of related it out to God. But I think people nowadays have somewhat gotten away from that. Although I think Mark Harold is fairly spiritual, um, is what I read in the book, at least my understanding of it. Uh, but anyway, so I think that you can see this idea of inscape in the way that like every bird really is different every fish that he makes really is different. Like everything has a really alive quality, right? Um, one of the influences that was mentioned throughout the book was Edward Bodden. And I definitely wrote down a bunch of different people who he wrote as influences to look up. So Edward Bodden, you can see the influence, I think, from Bodden, who was an illustrator and a printmaker and did a wide variety of stuff and had that similar kind of folk art style. Um, Joseph Crawhall is um, several times mentioned that his illustrations of animals, and I think you can again see the inscape of these animals. They seem in motion, they seem alive, they seem unique individuals, like they have names almost, you know, and certainly in this you know, sort of less finished piece, you can see that relationship that Harold uses as well. Um, I'm not sure how you pronounce this, but Julian Trevelyan, I'm going to take a stab at it, uh, is a really interesting artist who is totally new to me and listed as one of the influences, major influences from Mark Harold and a really just curious and interesting work. He's doing a mixture of drawing here. We have some found paper collage, which I can definitely see where Mark Harold picked up on some of it. Look at this, you know, sort of more pastoral scene, those bird shapes in the sky. He is different, but I see the influence and that's really, really lovely. Um, this John Piper is another person who was listed as an influence and he also is a printmaker. I, I hadn't realized it at first, but this is a screen uh, print. It's a layered screen print. I thought it was like a painting or something, but it's a screen print. And you can see a collage over here on the other side. Um, another screen print here of a cathedral. I just love the way like his collage, his painting, it all. He, again, these are artists who are exploring multiple different mediums to do all kinds of different things. Uh, I think that this nautical scene here, again, was probably a good influence uh, piece too. Okay. Uh, speaking of architecture too. Uh, so the other next thing right on the list is quotes. So here are some of the quotes that I picked out. I probably have twice this many actually in my studio notebook, but paintings that focus on the qualities of specific objects in nature. There's that inscape thing. Um, coming together of people's ordinary activities in nature, man's intervention in nature. That is the most romantic or visually rich set of elements. 
you know, and it sort of goes on and on. I, my One of my favorite here is he says the Staffordshire pottery appeals in that it is joyful, direct, and slightly crude, and in the way it is painted with the right balance of spontaneity and precision. And I thought that explains something that I've been chasing for years. I've always called it unfinished but resolved. Uh, and he's calling it spontaneity and precision. And what it sort of means is it's it's actually, if we go backwards in the slides for a second, it's almost like this piece right here by Joseph Crawhall. Like it is unfinished in some ways. It's not a it's not like these pieces, right? But it's resolved, like it's done. I believe that this is a finished work of art. It's not something that you, you know, just like happened upon. And I think that there's something uh, where it's drawn with beautiful precision, but it has a spontaneous quality. It doesn't feel like it was gone over and forced so many times. And I think these all have that quality of being, you know, precise, but spontaneous, precise, but spontaneous. I'm going to take that into my own lingo. Okay. Um, ideas to try. So I have a long list of ideas to try, and this is a great thing for you to do when there are no instructions. Okay. So there are no instructions. So what do you want to do? I want to try hand painted frames to support the artwork. I want to try thoughtful overprinting. I want to try making a map of my influences. I want to try making concertina cards. You know, I have a long list of things like that. And this way it's almost like I create my own exercise or an exercise for me about how to approach the work. So how do you come up with this list? Well, I think what you do is you look through the book right? And let me switch over. Let me remove this for just one second. So if you're looking through the book, what you can do is I'm saying, oh, I noticed that he has the brown hair in this one and the white hair in this one. So it's the same subject, similar, almost the same composition, but sort of, you know, opposing, uh, you know, winter, summer. Let me try that. So then onto my list goes, do the same image, but one warm tones, one cool tones. I don't pay rabbits, but I can still get something out of it. You know, here's that hand painted frame I was talking about. Let's see if you can see this, which is he does these for several of his things where he paints, you can see this is painted with dots where he paints the frame. So you can pretty much flip to like any page in here and say, hmm, what's something from here that's interesting to me that really appeals to me that I'd like to try? Well, look at this. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven different versions of birds. Now, these are probably big and a more finish that I would do. But let me try and do like a week of birds. Well, every day I'm going to make some sort of bird art and see if I get better at birds by the end of it or a hundred day project on birds. Or I could say like, look how these pieces come off the edge here. I want to do a series of work in which I'm continually going beyond the edge. And then that would just go on my list. So that's kind of how you gather that list of like things you want to do. Okay. Then the last side. The last list is observations and questions. Now, this is where you really bring, as Dr. Seuss would say, your unique Eunice to the party, right? This is the place where you need to say, you know, uh, from my point of view. So here are just a few from me. So one, lithographs, can you do them at home? That's a question that I had. So I actually went and looked and like I told you, I found some different videos and I watched them on how you can do lithographs at home, Okay. Uh, I noted that each bird, each fish, even the background ones have their own character. And I think that's an important thing because I'm very guilty of kind of um, copy and pasting, so to speak, even though I make, you know, analog, not digital work where like, I'm like, okay, well, if this is a butterfly shape, then let's make all the butterflies, the butterfly shape. But it's like, no, they can be general butterfly shape, but they should really, you know, have their own personality. So here's an example of that. You can see right here, maybe move over. So these fish look like they're the same at first and they are very, 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 very similar, but they're not actually the same. This one has stripes. This one doesn't. This one has sort of like um, long stripes here that has a big red area. You know, this one has a red patch up here. This one just has like orange polka dots. These little guys, like this one has a belly that's like this and some yellow stripes in the top. And then this one doesn't. So even though they're kind of the same, they're more like snowflakes. They're more like snowflakes. They're slightly different. Even the shapes of these fish, 
right? These are all cut from what I assume is the same piece of paper, but the curve in this fish is different than this one. The way that the paper's been used in this one, because this tail is all black, you don't see where he's drawn pen lines there. You know, this have a red line coming through. Like they're, they're enough similar that you see them as a grouping, not so similar that they're like copy and pasted. So I thought that was a really good thing. Um, another thing that I really liked from here was the color printing is done after the black printing. I think I said that you can actually see on top of the black areas, oops, on top of the black areas, you can actually see that pattern coming through, which is just so cool. So again, you can just sort of keep adding to this list as you go through. What are the things that you're observing? So it may not be a to-do for you. It may just be like, a, oh, that's interesting. Oh, that's a good thing to note. Oh, I see this. I see that. So that the book becomes a workbook. So you can turn any book into a book with instructions, so to speak. It's just you have to do the work of sort of writing the instructions for yourself. So I hope you found that useful. Uh, just so you know, our next book, if you're interested in coming to book club next month, is going to be on March 9th at 1215. We are going to be discussing the book Creative Strength Training by Jane Dunawalt. This book is full of exercises, by the way. I don't know if a month is going to be long enough for me to even get through this. Um, but this is a more of a classic um, art instruction book where you're going to find a ton of instructions, a ton of exercises. And Jane is a wonderful human being. Um, and I think she thinks about art in a lot of the same ways that I do. So I'm really excited to read this book and to dive into it because she takes a really intellectual approach to it. But she um, also went to uh, I believe some theology school or some uh, has done some religious studies. So she knows she comes to things from sort of a spiritual point of view, which I think is going to be interesting. Um, oh, thanks for saying you like my earrings. I, these are by some artists I have to say that I love. Um, and they were a gift for my mom because I've been following them on Instagram forever and one of them forever. Um, I, uh, but they do beautiful, beautiful stuff. Yeah, so Priscilla says that she has this book. So great, you're ready for the next book club. So I hope that you will all join me, that you had fun here in book club. If you did, by the way, one of the things that you can do to help book club really a lot, a lot, a lot is to tell a friend uh, about it. If you can tell a friend about it and say, hey, I really enjoyed book club or send the link to someone you know who might enjoy it, that obviously is the best thing. Um, and Ellen says, I remember her from your TV show. Are they going to do the show again? I'm sad to say that uh, Make It Artsy died a quiet death during the pandemic. We recorded the last season during the pandemic, and that is it. Um, and I'm sad, and uh, but I feel like there are more exciting things ahead. So uh, anyway, uh, thank you everyone for coming. I'm sorry to add on kind of a sad note, but I appreciate you. I'm glad you came. and. I'll see you next month. Bye.